What a great way to start the morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lord of Life. I'm Pastor Caitlin, and it is a delight to be here with you today. Whether you are worshiping in person or online, it is just such a delight. Our worship service today includes celebrating Holy Communion. So if you are at home, please feel free to grab your wine or juice and your crackers or bread, whatever feels like Holy Communion for you. And if you are in person, well, when we get to that part of the worship service, this infograph will come on the screen at that time. So make a mental note of where you are sitting It'll be up during that part of the service too. And you will follow the usher's direction to come forward. You'll receive the wafer and you will dip it into either the wine or the grape juice. Um, the wine is red, the grape juice is white. We also have prepackaged containers available as well. So please know that this is a gift of God's grace and it is for you. So please come for that. Um, today we also have Summer Sundays for Kids, which is for those who are ages 3 to 3rd grade. Um, after the opening prayer, we will send you out into the hallway area right out here, and um, there will be age-appropriate activities and a lesson for you out there, and then parents can pick them up after that. Uh, one thing I want to note of coming up in our community as our, with our life together is um, it is Lutheran Night at the Twins on August 2nd. Lord of Life has reserved a number of tickets. If you want to come and go to a Twins game with other people from Lord of Life, it should be a fun night. It's a Twins game, right? It's always a good time. Um, so more information about that at lordoflife.org. You can reserve your tickets and pay for them there. All right, and with that, I want to say a big thank you to David for leading us on piano and Ethan for leading us on vocals. I mean, you heard that prelude. It's only going to get better from here, which is awesome. Uh, thank you so much to our AV team, our hospitality team, and most importantly, thanks be to God for the gift of worship. So let us stand and sing. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. i 
Let us pray. God, our parent, you cradle us in love and provide for all that we need. In tenderness and strength, teach us to bear one another's burdens, extend a hospitality, and care for all that you have made. Free us to love our neighbors as ourselves without fear or shame. In Jesus' name we find our hope. Amen. You may be seated, and I invite children ages 3 through 3rd grade to head out those center doors right there to go to Summer Sundays for Kids. Today's reading is from Galatians chapter 6. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work, then at that work 
rather than their neighbor's work will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Al. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our holy gospel is from Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. Jesus said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in that same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. When we cleaned out our garage this spring, I made a mental note that this summer was going to be the summer where Luke, our five-year-old, was going to ride a bike without training wheels. I mean, maybe it's his age and being five. Maybe it was the dust and debris of nostalgia wafting through the air. Either way, I got my own bike down from storage. I pumped up those tires and I took a spin around the block. Oh, it felt great the wind in my hair, the wheels doing as they were supposed to, my body instinctively knowing what to do after years of going through those motions. It was easy, simple, fun. I guess there's a reason for that old saying, it's as easy as riding a bike. But I've got to tell you that while for me, riding a bike may be simple and easy and fun, teaching a five-year-old how to ride a bike is the exact opposite. He was so excited, we got it ready to go, he put his helmet on, and then I tried to explain these things that my body just knew, like how to balance on two wheels, how to keep pedaling when the instinct is just to freeze and stop. I mean, I really didn't have any of the words. How do you explain riding a bike to somebody who's never done it before? I mean, what felt like the longest 10 minutes in either of our lives, it was certainly an adventure, Um, we found out that neither one of us were having much fun, and we had to set it aside for a little while. Now, he has since gotten a better grasp on it and is very excited by this newfound skill that he is acquiring. But the whole experience really has me wrestling with those day-to-day things that I take for granted the experiences that have shaped who I have become today, the things that may be easy for me but difficult for someone else. I mean, the things that I can't explain why I do them but find myself doing. I mean, even the very ways that I show up and the communities that I choose to show up in. 
In the famous TED Talk, The Danger of a Single Story, writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie talks about how we're all shaped by the power of stories and that many stories and experiences make up who we are. The danger comes in when we reduce someone to a single story or attribute, and that becomes the only ways that they are seen. So for instance, she shared a story about growing up in Nigeria, comfortable middle-class university campus where she lived. Her father was a professor, and her family, like many others, had domestic help who came from a nearby village. She remembered a boy named Fide, whose poverty moved her to pity whenever her mother would offer them extra food or old clothing. That was how she thought of Fide, as this poor boy. So when she visited Fide's home, she was shocked when his family showed her this beautiful pattern basket that his brother had made. That didn't fit into the single story that she had in her head about who, families, or who Fide's family was. She didn't think that they could be anything but being poor. And then later, when she came to school in the United States, she was disappointed that her roommate asked her how she learned to speak English so well, when English is the, is the official language in Nigeria. And then in even another story, her roommate asked her to play some of her tribal music, and it was her roommate's turn to be dismayed when Chimamanda played her favorite CD, Mariah Carey. She describes her roommate's default position as patronizing well-meaning pity because she only had one single story of Africa, the one our Western culture tells us about beautiful landscapes and animals and incomprehensible people fighting senseless wars, unable to speak for themselves and waiting to be saved. For her roommate, that single story was easy to understand, but she didn't seem to know how to treat Chimamanda as an equal, as someone who was more like her in so many ways, as someone who's a complex person shaped by different experiences. Now, life would be much simpler if everyone only had a single story that shows them as one thing and only one thing, and then we get to tell that narrative over and over again until they become that thing. And it's our human tendency to try to do that too, to reduce one another to a single story. We like simple structures of how to navigate the world around us. But simple isn't always good or easy. Oftentimes that leads to being more destructive than helpful. How many of you have ever experienced being pigeonholed into a category because of some characteristic about yourself? Or how many of you have assumed something of another person because of one of their attributes? This happens rather frequently when it comes to gender, age, race, geographic location, orientation, and so much more. Our human tendency is to put people into categories, and once they're there, it's hard to change our perceptions and behaviors. And even when we learn that they are so much more than this limited perspective that we had, it, it still shows us that in many ways, reducing people to one thing or another is all about power and control and who has the upper hand. It becomes particularly harmful when somebody else decides what your story is and therefore who you are because of that thing. In her talk, Chimamanda says that to engage a person properly, we have to engage all of the stories that have made that person who they are. To take the time to see past our own perceptions of who someone else is. And I think the same can be said about our discipleship, the ways in which we follow Jesus. Now, at Lord of Life, we talk about five marks of discipleship. Worship, learn, serve, give, and invite. These are categories to help us root our values as a faith community into the gospel that Jesus proclaims and to have tangible ways of living them out. Making it easy to give ourselves some power over how we live out our lives of faith. And they're all well and good, but the danger comes when we make assumptions over how to live them out. Thinking if this specific practice works for me, then it must work for everyone else. 
reduced to a single story, modern day Christianity can become this idea that, well, that Christians have to be smiley, happy people all the time with no room for doubt or error, to be on their best behavior and never mess up, to have everything put together. I mean, maybe like Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, who's nice but a little bit off-putting at times. The stereotypes of Christianity could go on and on. And that single story can become incredibly harmful when it becomes more about ideals and less about the very real people of faith. It's also not what the kingdom of God that Jesus ushered in was all about. Even if we think about Jesus' named disciples in the Gospels, the, the twelve as they're called, um, as much as we like to lump them together thinking that they were exactly the same and they give us the metric of how to follow Jesus, they weren't a uniform bunch either. They were diverse, complex, more human than anything else. Thomas wrestled with skepticism. Peter was impetuous. Simon was overly passionate. Levi was living on the social margins. James and John earned the nicknames the Sons of Thunder. And Judas, well, Judas was Judas. Recognizing their diversity and looking at more than one story helps us understand what being a follower can look like in our own lives. In the gospel reading that we heard today, Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, where he would eventually be crucified and die. Last week, Pastor Joel talked about Jesus gathering his followers followers, and what some of the realities of following Jesus meant. And today, the journey continues, and we learn more about not just following Jesus, but what it means to be sent by Jesus. With 70 disciples around him, he sent them into the towns ahead of him two by two, carrying nothing, no food, no luggage, no sandals even, asking nothing of anybody and to simply rely on the hospitality of strangers. Now, if the human tendency is to seek out power, what Jesus was asking them to do was the opposite and very bold and vulnerable and carry absolutely nothing talk to no one, leave behind that backup bag you keep in the car for emergencies. His ask may sound simple enough, but it was anything but easy. Would you be able to rely on the hospitality of strangers for your basic needs? Rather than the independence that we are so accustomed to, they were told to be so interdependent on the communities that they would be encountering that they themselves would have to be comfortable with who they were and whose they were if they were going to share this countercultural message. I mean, Jesus even told them that it was like lambs being sent out in the midst of wolves. Because it's hard to have the upper hand when you rely on others to eat and to have safety. And all of the single stories that they may have had about the communities they were entering would have had to go to the back burner. All the things that they had taken for granted would have been a memory. And once there, they were equipped with only God's peace. Entering the towns, they were told to extend a word of peace. And if that person promotes peace, then it would rest on them. And if it doesn't, then that person wouldn't turn to them. As if the peace they were extending was something tangible, like well, like a carrier pigeon. You know, going out, resting on someone having that eye contact, creating that relationship between the two. Or it goes out, circles the area, doesn't find a place to land, and then comes back safely. No harm, no foul. To those who welcomed the disciples and to those who didn't, in either scenario, the disciples were asked to tell the people that the kingdom of God has come near. And then to let the people do with that what they would. Um, It made me think about this group that I meet with, with colleagues from around the country over Zoom. And one of the first things that we do when we gather is to share how we're committing to be present at the time, and then also what is one thing we need to set aside for the time. Now, at first, I found this practice incredibly difficult. 
I'm of the mindset of, it's fine, we're fine, everything is good. And plus with Zoom meetings, it's easy to get distracted by any number of things. And sometimes showing up with intention is difficult. But I've got to tell you that the more familiar we became with the practice of naming our intentions, naming our needs, naming what we need to put aside, the more connected we became to one another, the more we were able to trust each other. And I wonder if that's part of what it means to be healed, like the disciples who were sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God to, to others were. It's to have that ability to be honest about what your needs and vulnerabilities are and to the openness of being able to meet those needs in community, in creating relationships that aren't dependent on the material things, and to celebrate with authenticity that comes with seeing beyond the single simple stories that we tell about ourselves and others. It doesn't always have to be fine. That's when the kingdom of God becomes a space where we can bear one another's burdens. As we heard Al read about in the, in the, from the book of Galatians, sorry. And we begin to acknowledge our own and others' needs. Recognizing that we don't need to be invincible. We don't need to be self-reliant. We don't need to be smiley, happy people all the time. We simply need to be present to one another. And when we're intentional about, intentional about that, it isn't easy, but it sure is worth it. With all of our vulnerabilities and met and unmet needs, we can be a part of creating communities of belonging where everyone's needs matter and everyone gets to consent to how they are being met. So this weekend, as we prepare to celebrate for Independence Day, maybe we can also celebrate Interdependence Day. See what I did there? Filled with the richness of being a community centered on peace and honest in expression Every day that we celebrate it, and every day can be Interdependence Day, we get a chance to feel those words that Jesus proclaims, to see Satan fall and for the kingdom of God to break in. Amen.
Please stand as you are able. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, creation, and all in need. Lord of the harvest, you send your people into the world to proclaim peace and renewal to all. Free us from the guilt or shame that may prevent us from extending your kingdom to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your creation abounds with flowing waters and diverse creatures. Guide the work of climate scientists as they develop and advocate ways to restore Earth's natural balance. Motivate humankind to adopt lifestyles that protect and sustain the Earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You guard the nations. Let no leaders exalt themselves, but lift up the most vulnerable and work for the good of all. Send your spirit to eradicate classism and inequity, violence and war, poverty and hunger. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You desire abundant life for all. As we celebrate Independence Day, instill in us gratitude, generosity, and persistence in working toward freedom for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You care for all people in need. Nourish those who are hungry. Restore employment to those who have lost work. Heal those who are sick, especially Joanne Cross, Deb Steck, Diane Moody, and Joey Lindblad. And comfort all who are grieving, including Chuck and Pat Berger at the death of their daughter, Lovey Kinvig at the death of her sister, and the family and friends of Karen Anderson at her death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a sign of peace with one another. And you may be seated. Well, if you've been around Lord of Life's campus this week, there is a likely chance that you have seen a lot of kids and teens in brightly colored t-shirts. Vacation Bible school kids and volunteers, summer stretch participants, and children, youth, and family staff all get their own t-shirts to show which program they are a part of. They also help kids find who their leaders are. I mean, just look for those bright green shirts over there. It's because of your generous gifts that we're able to equip our volunteers with t-shirts, name tags, and other items that help them serve this community so well. So thank you for your generosity. Giving can be done in any of the ways listed on the screen, including the passing of the plates that'll happen in just a moment. If online or text to give makes sense for you and your family, please feel free to pull out your phone as an act of worship. Again, thank you so much for your generosity. dying land watering with your words of love so that they will understand that the love that God has shed upon us is a love that will never fade away let me share it with the world I'll go I'll be the one to go
There's a need we cannot see Cause we're blinded by our own Help us sense the suffering That they carry all alone Let me be the voice that's giving Answers to their need That Jesus is the truth, the life Please stand as you are able. As we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion, we remember that in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new promise in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated, and please know that this table is for you.
Please stand as you are able. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in grace. And as you go into your week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All our children of God, loved beyond measure, sent to serve the world. 